So before we begin, I just wanted to give you a quick agenda of today. So we're gonna start with talking about what is economics and then what is game theory. I'll give some examples. And at the end of the lecture, I'll talk more about my own interest in economics and you know, other interests that I have in classes I've taken at college. But if you have any questions, please feel free to ask me. I know we have like a Q&A afterwards um, and I'll try to go slowly, but if I'm going fast, please let me know as well. So to start, I wanted to ask all of you, what do you think of when you hear the word economics? So if you could answer in the chat, um, any words or phrases that you think of when you hear the word economics? Oh, I see something, money. Yeah, mathematics, mm -hmm. fund, market, finance. I'll wait for like another minute or so. Economy, business, work, math, society, marketing, market, company, depression, graph, society, radical, communism, trade, theoretical, Bitcoin. Oh yeah, that's something that's very current. Politics, line graphs, work. Interesting, difficult number. Okay. Yeah, wow. Thank you for sending all this stock. Yeah, so I'm seeing a lot of like money, finance, market, e economy, math, graphs, analysis. I saw one that was very interesting. Someone said depression. <laughs> I hope my lecture is not depressing, but we'll see how that goes. Share, yeah, that's a good one too. Work, yeah, well, please keep them going, but I'm going to move on. I see a lot of difficult as well. So yeah, I feel like a lot of people think economics is difficult. Well, I hope I get to change that. So. You know, here are some words that I listed that I was imagining that you would think of. And I think someone, some people said money for sure. Um, bank, taxes, bond, and the other said market, fund, um, and so on. And, you know, these are words that I often see on the news and I'm sure that you also often see on the news. And I think most of the words that were put in the chat were things that you would kind of like see in the news. Um, but I'm imagining that these are also words that seems kind of difficult, right? Like I look at these and I feel like they're difficult. And um, I saw some of you putting in a chat like difficult. That's what you think of when you hear the word economics and that is very valid. So in today's lecture, what I really wanna do is that I want to show that there's more to economics than just these words. Um, I feel like a lot of you really focused on that money aspect or the math aspect in the chat um, and game theory. Yes, it is related to money or related to math, but we have a lot more to, that, um, to economics than just that. So to start off, um, I wanna talk a little about, well, what is economics? What are some subfields of economics? What are some topics that we cover? So within economics, we have two big kind of like subfields. Um, which is microeconomics and macroeconomics. Okay, I said it backwards, macro and micro. And you may have heard of that if you've taken economics before. Within macroeconomics, we have topics like cash flow. This is kind of like how does money circulate in the market? How is money generated? You know, we also have GDP, gross domestic product, um, and banks. So macro is more of the big picture, like how does money circulate in the country or across the world? Versus microeconomics, um, we have topics like price of a good. How do we decide how much this one thing costs, right? Um, as well as economics of education and game theory. So the topic that we're talking about today falls under microeconomics. And my interest area actually lies in economics of education. And I'll talk more about my own interest at the end of this presentation. But if you are interested, please feel free to ask any questions about it as well. Okay. So yeah, I think I'm going to move on. So now we're gonna get into game theory. So just some definitions at the beginning. 
Game theory is defined as the study of the ways in which strategic interactions occur between two or more players. Well, that was a lot of words. So let's define each of those um, kind of like parts. So I said ways in which strategic interactions occur. So what is a strategy? Strategy is a complete plan of action of a player, a complete plan of action. And these strategies, strategic interactions occur between players. Players are the agents, people or groups who are making decisions. So game theory is basically a study where you have two or more people each making their own decisions with a plan of action and they're trying to maximize their payoff. So um, payoff is basically the benefits from playing the game. So all of the players in game theory or in the games are trying to maximize their payoffs. So these are some words that I want you to keep in mind as we go through our lecture today. So yeah, we're gonna start with a very basic game, which is the prisoner's dilemma. And if you've heard of game theory or some other social science, maybe you've heard of it. So if you know the answer, Please keep it a secret until the end. So um, prisoner's dilemma is where you have two prisoners. Um, they're both in jail, just they're prisoners. And the police basically finds out that these two prisoners have committed another crime. And the police comes to each of those prisoners and say, you have a choice whether to confess or to stay silent. And this is the condition that the police gives. Basically, if both prisoners confess, then they will face 10 years in jail. However, if one of them confesses, but the other one stays silent, the one that confesses will have zero years in jail, while the one that stays silent will have to face 20 years. If they both stay silent, they will each be in jail for another year but they are not allowed to talk to each other. And this is very important. And just a quick economic term, this table that I'm showing right here is called the normal form representation of the game. The normal form representation of the game. And it's a way to show um, how the game occurs. And here the players are the prisoner A and prisoner B. And we were talking about maximizing payoff. Here we're trying to actually minimize it, right? You don't want many years in jail. So um, basically the two prisoners do not know what the other one will choose. So I want you to think what they should do. So in the chat, if you could answer which option you think is best, should they both confess? Should they both stay silent or should one of them confess? What would be the best result? Wow, that's a lot of these. Okay, we have one A. Some people are saying A and a lot of people are saying D. Interesting. Um, I have a question. Other, the prisoners don't know what the other others do, right? Exactly. So they're they just don't asking know. for their. So mm -hmm. they're acting for their own. They're they're only acting to ma maximize their own payoff, right? So like exactly. so that they get like, at least years in jail. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to be very considerate to each other. Well, we'll find out. But yes, you are right in that they do not know what each other is gonna choose. Okay, so I'm seeing a lot of D's and a lot of A's in the chat. Okay, does anyone wanna speak about their choice and why they chose the one? D would be best, but not guaranteed. So A is better. That's true, that's true. It's a very good way of thinking. 
yeah, I feel like the people who chose D thought, well, D is like the best option because, you know, you obviously have, have the least number of years, but then you don't know if the other person will stay silent. Well, that's a very good way of thinking. So what will they do, right? I'm gonna walk through this process. So we're gonna look at prisoner A first and then prisoner B. So just looking at prisoner A, each of them will basically choose based on what they think the other person will do. So prisoner A thinks, okay, let's say B confesses. If B confesses, then I have the choice of confessing, confessing or staying silent. Well, if B confesses, then I'm better off confessing, right? Then staying silent is 10 years is less than 20. Okay, then let's say B stays silent. Well, then if I confess, I get zero years. If I stay silent, I get one. And therefore, I'm better off confessing. Therefore, no matter what B chooses, it is better to confess. And therefore, prisoner A will choose confess. And in game theory, um, this confessing is called the dominant strategy for prisoner A. The dominant strategy. Okay, so let's do a similar thing with prisoner B. So prisoner B also considers his strategy based on what he thinks prisoner A will choose. So, okay, let's say prisoner A confesses. Should I confess or stay silent? Well, 10 is less than 20, I should confess, right? Similarly, if prisoner A stays silent, well, it's pretty much the same process as prisoner A, and therefore prisoner B should confess. So prisoner B's dominant strategy is also confessing. So for both prisoners, confessing is the best choice. And in game theory, this best choice is called the dominant strategy. So they both choose to confess. And in economics terms, staying silent, which is the other choice, is called the dominated strategy, dominated strategy, because there's the dominant strategy that is dominating the dominated strategy. Hope that's not too confusing. But yeah, that is basically kind of like the process in which you think through in game theory, where you go through a table and look at each of the options and see which one is the best. How do you maximize your payoff? Okay. So we're gonna move on to our, um, okay. So um, before we move on, I know a lot of people chose D and it is kind of obvious that if they both stayed silent, it's probably the best choice. And so you might be thinking, why well, confess? Well, the thing is that these two prisoners cannot communicate with each other. So if they don't know what each other is gonna choose, then confessing is the best choice as we walk through the table. But if they are able to cooperate, then obviously they should stay silent, right? If they're able to talk to each other, why confess? So I'll talk through like different types of games at the end of this presentation, but if they were able to communicate, then the result will be totally different. So, um, well, you might be thinking like, is it possible for us to like not know what the other person's going to do? Like that game was hypothetical. So I'm gonna give you now a table of a game that you all are very familiar with. And if you're looking at this table and you know what the game is, um, I will tell you what it is at the end, but right now let's go through the process um, and you'll see if you know what the game is and I'm sure you all know. So this is a no normal form representation of another type of game. And I want you to think, think through what choice is the best. So for person A, option one, two, and three. So they have three options. Which one do you think is the best option to choose? So first gonna let you think, and if you wanna type it in the chat, I'll give you a couple minutes to think through.
So one, two, and three, these are just like different options. So in prisoner's dilemma, these were, you know, like confess, stay silent, right? Here, I'm intentionally just leaving it as numbers because if I reveal them, you know what game it is and you'll know the answer. So just think of one, two, and three as different actions that person A can take. And if person A takes action one and B takes action one, they both gain zero points. That's how you would read this table. Hope that makes sense. Oh, interesting. So we have three, one, two, two, one, two, three, one, two, three. Okay, so it's kind of like, I feel like we're split. I'm seeing a lot of twos, but we're pretty split in terms of numbers. Oh, yep, I see someone saying all equal and then another person saying same thing happens whatever option they choose. Yeah, you are actually on the right track. Um, yeah, I, I see some same. All right, well, let's look through it then. I think you know what I'm trying to get to now. So let's say person B chooses option one, action one. Well, then which score does A get? Zero, negative one, and one. So they would want one, right? So they should take action three. Well, yeah, if B does two, B takes action two, then for A, it's best to take action one. And if B chooses action three, then it's best to take action two for person A. So yes, the people who said it's the same, that is true. Depending on which action B takes, the best action changes, right? So there's no dominant strategy here for person A. And very similar to that, what should person B do? Well, let's look at it one by one. If person A chooses one, then B should choose two. Oh wait, no, not two, three, sorry. Um, if A chooses two, then it's gonna be um, one. Sorry, I forgot to put the circles, I realized. Um, but you know how it goes now that um, the best choice changes depending on what the other person says or does. Yeah, exactly. So they each don't know what each other is gonna do. And so there's actually not a best choice. Yes, so I'm gonna ask you two questions with this game. So first of all, what is this game? If you know the answer, please put it in the chat. And if you don't know it in English, um, you can also type it in Japanese. Okay. Yep, yes, I'm seeing the right answers. Yes, Jenkin, exactly, rock, scissors, paper. Yeah, exactly. So is there a way to win this game? Is there a dominant strategy? Do you think there is a way to win? Oh, I see a yes. <laughs> okay, okay. We're assuming that you don't know what the other person's gonna do. You're assuming, we're assuming that you're not gonna communicate. Is there a way to win? Ah, I, I mean, if you could communicate, right? You know, it would be really nice, but. Um, mm -hmm. um, I heard this um, theory in like psychology that if you play a game of rock, paper, scissors, people are most likely to put out rock first. So it's better strategy to put down paper or something. <laughs> That's very interesting. I mean, True, if the percentage, if you know the probability of people putting out certain things and if it's not equal, then this table can definitely change. So you have a good point there. Um, I think that will fall more under behavioral economics, which is another subfield of economics. But yes, we do have studies where we kind of combine economics and psychology. So you do have a very good point. 
But within this table and what we have right now laid out here, we're going to say that there's no one way to win this game. But yes, thank you for that point because I think that is very valid for sure. And that's a really nice way to think about it too. Okay. So yeah, well, you all guessed it right. It is rock, paper, scissors, um, which is junkin in Japanese. And there is no way to win this game for sure. So in other words, there's no dominant strategy in this game. Also, um, I know you point, um, or you pointed out like a very good point about psychology and people like are likely to put out something. I think the point of game theory is that you need to know for certain what you're gonna do or like what the other person's gonna do. So that dominant strategy is a strategy in which you will win or like you will maximize your payoff for sure, no matter what. And so we're not really thinking about that psychology and like the possibility because it's not, you know, 100%, that makes sense. But yes, great points. Great. So yeah, basically one, two, and three were rock, scissors, and paper. Okay, yeah. And these are like the winning ones and obviously they're not the same. So, sorry, um, moving on. Um, I know I've been focusing on games where two players act at the same time and they don't get to communicate to each other. And I know some people were saying like, well, if you know what the other person is doing or like if you're allowed to talk, right? So there are types of games where you get to talk. So here are some different types of games within the field of game theory. So, um, the first way to categorize games in game theory is whether you can cooperate. So in some games, you cannot communicate with the other players, like the ones we did today. The prisoners could not talk with each other. But there are other games where you are allowed to cooperate. So then you are communicating with the other person, but you also have the choice now whether you want to cooperate, whether you want to follow the plan that you told the other person that you're going to do, you know, sometimes that also becomes like a strategy and it definitely becomes a lot more complicated. And I do want to emphasize that today I'm really focusing on the basics of game theory. So if you felt like a lot of the games that we've done are very easy, yes, I am kind of like scratching the surface. And if you have more questions, please let me know. And then another type way to categorize games within game theory is the repeated versus sequential games. So in today's games, the players act, acted at the same time, right? We had prisoner A and prisoner B choose whether they're going to confess at the same time. However, we also have other types of games where the players act in a sequence. So one of the players make a choice first and then the other player makes their choice. So think of like board games, right? One person will move first before the others or like chess or um, you know, a lot of like card games and things like that. These are sequential games because you're not acting at the same time. And that will also change your strategy. So yeah, these are the types of games. So um, I think one big lesson that we can learn from game theory is the importance of imagining the other's decision when making decisions. So, you know, we talked through, okay, so if prisoner B does this, then I should do this. If prisoner B does that, I should do that. So I think game theory not only teaches like economics and that numbers, but also an important life lesson in that it is very important to think through our strategies. What choices do we have? What are the choices that the other people have? And what are the consequences? What are the things that you gain? What are the payoffs, right? I think after learn learning game theory for me personally, Personally, whenever I'm making decisions, I would think through all my options. I would list out the pros and cons. What are the gains? What are the losses? And it really made my life easier in terms of making decisions. So it's not just for economics, but for other things, it's very, very applicable. Well, with that being said, some of you might be wondering, well, we saw a lot of games, but how is it related to economics, right? So. I'm gonna talk a little bit about how it's um, kind of like related to economics. Um, and so 
game theory applies to any oligopolies. And oligopolies are basically where we have two or more firms competing to sell the same goods. Um, but then the firms have power over the cost of the goods because we don't have that many firms selling the same goods. So if we have like a uh, hundred, like a hundred companies selling like pencils, um, then each of those companies do not have control over the price of the pencil, right? You know, there's really not much of a difference. But let's say, like, let's think of airlines. I think that's a good example. In Japan, I know the major airlines are Japan Airlines and ANA. Um, if you have objections, sorry, I think those two are like pretty big. Um, and so, because it's just those two that are pretty major, they are of course competing to sell their tickets, but they also have control over the cost of their tickets. They get to kind of like play with their costs. And in those kind of settings, these are called oligopolies. You know, they're really looking at like, okay, what's the other person gonna do and what should I do, right? So that often is kind of like that game theory. And you can really use game theory to study oligopolies. And um, also there's, you know, I talked about the repeated versus sequential games, and these are used um, to look at how firms make decisions. And there's different types of those. So I'm actually going to give you a quick example. I'm not going to talk through it. So if you have questions, please just ask me in the Q&A at the end. But um, first, looking at repeated games um, within like firms, like actual firms, um, you know, say there are two firms that decide, need to decide on the amount of output that they make and each say season, like spring, summer, winter, and fall, spring, summer, fall, winter, sorry, that was messed up. Um, the firm decides, okay, for this season, we're gonna make this amount of um, goods. We're gonna sell this amount. And each of those firms may, let's say, need to make a decision on whether they're gonna make a low output or a high output. And here, this is like a quick table of like, you know, the amount of goods that they're gonna produce and how much they're gonna gain from that. So if we go through that strategy that we talked through earlier, just you know, looking through what the other person's gonna do and so on, then the output will be high, high. They will both produce high output. That's the dominant strategy. However, you can see that if they were able to communicate then if they both produce low output, they actually are gonna gain more, right? In the end, their profit is more. And so what happens in real, real life with repeated games, because they're repeatedly choosing the output, right? It's not just once. They would go again in the next season. So they are going to signal each other to give low output. There are several ways to do that. Um, I'm just gonna talk through the examples and yeah, um, but, for example, firm A can continuously produce low output. And that's kind of a signal telling firm B to also produce low output. There's also ways to like threaten. Some firms will do that. There's a lot of like real life examples with that, but um, that's how like a game can work out in real life. And then I didn't talk too much about sequential games. I'm not gonna talk about it much. Um, but I just wanted to show you what it looks like to think through sequential games. And so sequential games are basically games that I said, as I said, one player acts before the other player. So in real life in economics, it's when a firm, one of the firms make a decision before another firm does. So a great example of that is to enter or not enter a market. Let's say we have a startup. The startup has a decision whether to enter or not enter. And then the companies that are already in the market, the incumbents, those are the companies that are in the market, they have the choice of whether they want to fight that startup or they would accommodate that startup, whether they would you know, cooperate or to fight. And so to think through that, instead of using tables like we saw earlier, because they act in a sequence, they don't act at the same time. Oops, sorry. Yeah, um, we use trees. So this is like a tree game tree that we use in game theory. I'm not gonna talk through it as I mentioned, cause I don't, I didn't wanna like put too much information onto you all. But if you have questions, please feel free to ask me later. But yeah, those are like different types of games that we talked today. 
and some real life examples in the market. So with all of this, what I really wanna say is that economics is not just about money. And yes, economics may seem very difficult, but it can be very, very fun. Um, and in game theory classes at college, like we play a lot of games with each other and just, you know, try out these things and play with these tables and look through strategies. And there's just so much more to economics than money. And so, yeah, this is the slide that I show you, showed you earlier, but there's just so many different fields and topics within this um, field of economics. And so I only scratched the surface of game theory and there's so much more to it. So I hope, you know, if you gain interest in economics that you can look into it more in the future. So to, okay, sorry. To kind of like end this presentation, I'm gonna talk a little about how I gained interest in economics and also in other subjects. Um, you may have noticed that I also have a major in math and I also have a concentration, just kind of like a minor in education studies. I also have interest in like language education, pedagogy. Um, and so I'm gonna talk about like, how did I get interested in all of these things and how did I come to my econ major? So my interest in economics kind of started in high school where I was taking a class on big data back when I was a high school student. So I did research um, in big data, but I also had an interest in education because I grew up in different countries. And as a result, I gained interest in the different education systems. And I kept thinking, how can I combine these two? Like, I like data, I like analyzing, I like math, but I'm also really interested in education. And this was when I um, met this subject, economics of education, which is a really like an intersection of economics um, and education to really kind of like analyze the outcomes of education. We look at things like, you know, what does a year of education do to income or happiness? You know, if you get more education, do you get more happy? Do you get more healthy? you get more income in the future. Um, and yeah, there are a lot of research out there about that. And um, I know earlier I mentioned like I go to Oberlin, which is a liberal arts college in the US. So although I'm a math and economics major, I also take a lot of classes outside of my major field. So I'm just gonna kind of show you like classes I've taken and I wanted to kind of show like what it's like to go to a liberal arts college in the US. So in my first year, and I put the classes in economics are in green and the classes in math are in blue. So you can see that more than half of my classes were actually outside of my major field. So I took, you know, introduction to economics. I took labor economics, which is about like, you know, when do people decide to work versus when do people decide not to work? I took multivariable calculus, discrete math, these are math classes. I also took an education class. I took a history class where we interviewed people in the town. Um, I took Chinese, I took Japanese language pedagogy, which was about teaching Japanese. So here's a photo of me teaching. Um, yeah, I think it was modest expression. So Kegel, I was like learning how to create lessons and this was my Chinese language class. Yeah, and kind of continuing my second year, these are the classes within economics and math. So took more classes outside of my major. Philosophy in the schools, I got to go to an elementary school in the town where my college is and have philosophy discussions with kids every week. That was a class I took. Um, another class I took was language pedagogy, like how do you teach a language? Um, I also took a class called Japan on stage and screen where we had actual kabuki actors come all the way from Japan. So this is like the backstage where I got to help out. So yeah, you can see I've been taking a wide range of classes. This is my third year, it was a COVID year, but so yeah, I also wanted to kind of show photos of what college looked like under COVID. So we had outside classes so that, you know, we're spaced out and it's a lot safer. So this was one of my classes outside. And this is a classroom um, that we had this semester. So you can see that all the desks are separated because of COVID. Um, but yeah, you can see outside of my majors, I took classes like teaching and tutoring writing, linguistics, 
language disability and sensory ecologies. That was a really fun class. So I think through my liberal arts education, I've really been able to explore different subjects, take different classes, and also see the intersection of those different subjects. Um, so just to end off, I really want to, yeah, kind of show you an overview and highlight um, what I see in the value of education. So I think people often see like, you know, education is for like my career or to get a good job or to gain knowledge. But what I really see as a huge value of education is gaining transferable skills that you can apply to different disciplines. Learning things that um, you can, you know, put in use in different subjects. So today I talked about game theory, but I also, you know, kind of said how I used it for life decisions and decision making in general. So it is very applicable to other settings. Similarly, like I found my math classes to be actually very helpful for philosophy because the logic within math helped me read philosophy papers. And so there were so many ties that I found through my courses. And I think that was a value that I saw through my college experience. Uh, and that was like one of the things I really wanted to show through my class today. So yeah, thank you all for listening. Thank you for participating. I loved seeing all your comments in the chat um, and I'm looking forward to the Q&A later. Oh, I see you. That's all. Thank you for listening. はい、では皆さん本当にあ、あの、ま、GDP、お金、銀行と割とこう大きい国としてま、どのようにお金が動いてるのかなとか、国同士でどのようにお金が動くのかなみたいな話をよく扱います。では続いてゲーム理論についても少し詳しく説明をお願いします。ありがとうございます。じゃあ、続いて、あの、授業の中でも詳しく取り扱っていただいた囚人の事例ま、についてもご説明お願いします。はい、囚人の事例ま、ゲーム理論でよく扱う、あの、ゲームなので、知ってる
ですよね。だから相手が何を選ぶかっていうのは予想はせずに、じゃあもし白状したらどっちがいいだろうと。まあ、囚人 B が白状したら、囚人 A は10年か20年なら10年の方が少ないから白状した方がいいでしょう。もし囚人 B が白状しなかったら、しなかった場合は0か1年。なら0の方がいいから白状しますと。なので、えっと、囚人 B がどちらを選んだとしても囚人 A は白状するっていうのが良い選択肢となります。はい、で、そうですね、これは、えっと、本当に囚人 B も同じように考えていくので、結果的に囚人 A も囚人 B も白状するというのが一番良い選択肢となります。はいはい、そうですね、なのでお互いが何を選択するかわからないというこの状況下では、2人とも白状するのが一番良い選択になりますで今回の場合こう相手が何を選択したとしても自分にとっては白状するっていうのが良い選択肢ですよねなのでその選択肢今回白状するっていう選択肢を支配戦略授業内でダーミネンストラテジーですけど支配戦略というふうに言いますでは続いてゲーム理論の種類についても説明していただいてよろしいでしょうかはいゲーム理論いろんな種類がありまして、まあ、これ一つ一つ名前がついてたりするんですけど今回ちょっと名称はなしで説明していきたいなと思いますまずゲーム理論協力するかしないかで大きく結果が変わってきます今回の囚人のジレンマの場合は2人は協力できませんでしたね会話ができなかったのでもし2人が協力できたらおそらく結果はまた異なっていたのかなと思いますというわけでゲームに参加している人たちが話し合いをできるかどうかでゲーム理論というのは違う種類のゲームになりますそれから同時に行動するかしないかですね。今日やったのは2人が同時に行動してましたけど、もし、えっと、何かのゲームでこう1人が先に行動して、もう1人後から行動していたら、多分後から行動する人の、えっと、戦略とかプランっていうのは変わってきますよね。で、まあ、多分皆さんの身近なゲーム、例えばチェスとかトランプとかオセロとかも、多くのゲームがこのどちらかが先に行動するっていうシークエンシャルゲームの方に入るのかなと思います。ありがとうございます。では最後に、足立さんにとって経済学やゲーム理論を学ぶ意義みたいなものを教えていただいてもよろしいですかはい、そうですね。ゲーム理論から学べること何かなっていうことで、一つ私がすごく学んだのが、こう相手の立場にとって自分が何をすべきか考えるっていうことと、あの自分のこう選択肢とかプランを立てるときに、一つ一つの選択肢を見ていって、こうそれぞれの良さと悪さっていうんですかを考えることの大切さというのはすごく学んだなと思います。なので私自身が何か選択をするときに結構今までは割と、まあ、適当というかこう感覚で選ぶことが多かったんですけどそうじゃなくてじゃあこういう選択肢があってこう相手はこういうふうにあの行動してじゃあ自分はこれが一番いいんじゃないかみたいなふうに結構戦略的に考えるようにはなったかなと思います。それからまあ今日かなり伝えたかったのは経済学ってお金だけじゃないんだよって。いいうのをすごくく伝えたくて私自身でそうあんまりこう金融とか銀行とかに興味があるわけではないですね。でも経済学専攻して勉強していて楽しんで勉強はしているのであのお金とか銀行とか,なんか経済学難しそうだなって思っている人にも少しでも興味持ってもらえたらなというふうに思ってます。ありがとうございます。私も今、大学の授業で、あの小学部に所属しているので、大学の授業で経済学を勉強しているんですけど、今回の,あの杉下さん、あ杉下すみません、足立さんの、えー、講義をとか解説を聞いて、さらにこう経済学だとか、あとはあのゲーム理論についても,あのもう勉強するのすごく興味が湧きました。ありがとうございました。えー、皆さんもこれまでの解説や講義や解説を聞いて、質問とか感想があったらチャットでシェアしてくださるとして嬉しいです。結構なんかコメントでいっぱい来てて、すごい英語でも皆さんあの感想を書いてくださってありがとうございます。ありがとうございます。では続いてですね、単語解説の方に移っていきたいと思います。ぜひ皆さんメモを取って今後の英語学習に役立ててください。ではまず最初、Prisoner's Dilemma。これはえっと、囚人のジレンマといった、まあ、役で、まあえっと、今回の授業で、えー、足立さんがあの詳しく説明してくださったものです。続いて、No more form representation of the game。こちらは、プレイヤー集合、えー、戦略空間利、えー利と、利益関数の3つの要素から構成される展開型ゲームと、あと、それと非協力ゲームの基本的
、えー、表現形式といった意味があります。ちょっと難しいんですけど、あの今回の授業を聞いたらあの、だいぶこういうのが理解できてくれるのかなと思います。続いて、Confess。こちらは動詞なんですけど、えっと、今回の授業ではあの囚人のジレンマで囚人 A と B がその白状するか白状しないかっていうので使われていました。でこの Confess っていう動詞は、えっと、告白するっていう意味もあります。続いて、ドミネントストラテジー。こちらは支配戦略といった意味があって、えーとまあ、経済学の用語では戦略型ゲームにおけるあるプレイヤーの戦略で、他のプレイヤーの戦略の選択によらず、他のすべての選択よりも、あるいは以上に高い利益を得られる戦略のことを示します。続いて、リピートシークエンシャルゲームズ。こちらは繰り返しゲーム、総合,総合進行ゲーム。といった意味になりますあの今回の,そのゲーム理論の説明のところでも出てきましたね。で最後に、オリゴポリー。こちらは、えっと、河川といった意味があります。あの多分、経済学とかをあの勉強されている方がこの、えっと、イベントの参加者には多いと思うので、多分、河川という言葉が結構出てくると思うんですけど、多分今後、あの論文とか英語で読むようになったら、きっとこの単語をいっぱい見つけると思うので、ぜひ覚えてみてください。え以上で単語解説を終わります。今解説したワード以外でもしあの授業内で分かんなか